All right, great. Hi, everyone. We have uh, Zhongyi Li from Caltech, who is going to be talking about partial differential equations and how to solve them. So he's a second year PhD student uh, at Caltech, advised by Anima Anand Kumar. And he has uh, been working broadly in deep learning theory as well as empirical applications. And recently, he worked on developing deep learning methods for solving differential equations. He was an undergrad at Washington before uh, joining Caltech. So yeah, Zhongyi, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, can you see me screen? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about our uh, line of work, Neural Orbiter, to solve partial different equations. Uh, so this is a collaboration work done as we machine learning people and uh, applied math people and mental science people uh, at Caltech. And so today I'm going to first give some introduction and motivation to use neural operators. And we'll give some framework and definition of it. Then we're going to talk about the first graph-based operator, which is one of the work we submit to new ribs. And then it's newly done the Fourier neural operators. And then we'll proceed into uh, experiments and future work. Okay, so if you have any questions, just interrupt me, feel free to ask. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we want to solve differential equations. Uh, equations everywhere governing problems in engineering and physics. And some of the equations are very hard to solve. Uh, we're thinking about uh, using machine learning to learn this equation from data to speed up traditional solvers and make it more uh, solvable and accurate. Okay, so the problem setting is kind of like image to image problem. Uh, so fix a family or fix a parametric uh, equations. We want to learn the map from the input coefficient function or the boundary function to the output solution functions. So you can imagine this is uh, uh, some geometry information to like later time velocity or is uh, some like time zero solution to time one solution. So we want to map uh, like image to image mapping. Like take a little bit concrete example. Uh, this is second order elliptic equations. And here uh, the input is function A, this coefficient function appearing in the differential operator. And if we fix uh, the source F, this equation is going to define a map, a solution operator from this input function A to the output function U. And we want to learn this map from the input uh, function space A to the output function U. Now here A is like is L in and U is like H1. But in general, deep learning method doesn't care too much about the function space. So we will just take it as an image to image problem. Okay. So we want to learn this operator uh, by using data sets. So that is, uh, we want to fix this. Uh, map and given a multiple training instance, I want to directly learn this map, learn the trajectory. Just like the other deep learning method, it's slower to solve, but once it is trained, uh, it's very fast to inference, very fast to evaluate. And compared to traditional solver, where we use finite element or finite difference methods, uh, we have to solve this equation or approximate the gradient, something like that, by discretizing it in a very fine mesh. And the accuracy of the traditional methods usually depend on the mesh. Uh, we need to truncate in spatial domain and temporal domain to a very fine grid to have a nice approximation. On the other hand, the data driven method, uh, the accuracy doesn't depend on the mesh, it depends on the quality of the data sets. So given its input coefficient, usually follow a distribution, for example, sample from a random Gaussian field. And given this training data to map from input coefficient to output coefficient, we can directly learn the trajectory from this distribution. So we don't need to like, approximate the gradient or something discrete, discrete that on the grid. We can directly uh, predict the trajectory, learn this trajectory from this distribution. Yeah, so what color is the solve equation versus learning equations? To solve equation, once, once a time you solve one instance and usually it requires the explicit form, there's a trade-off on resolution. 
And the resolution is coarse, it's fast, but it's less accurate. When it's fine, it takes longer time, right? For the data-driven method, it depends on the quality of the data. Uh, so it's uh, like distribution of family of PDEs, and usually it's taken as black box, so it doesn't care too much about this specific family of equations. And because it doesn't rely on the resolution, it's, it can be resolution invariant and mesh invariant. It's slow to train and fast to inference. Uh, there are also some drawback for the data drive methods, uh, because for when you're solving the equation, uh, it's a lot of freedom. You can change the parameters, boundary, and initial condition relatively easily. But the data driven method, uh, the input coefficient or, or its input in general has to follow a distribution. If a lot of things are changing, uh, that means we're learning a large, a huge distribution. We need more input samples. It makes things hard to learn. So, usually, we can only change one thing. For example, change the uh, input coefficient and fix the boundary condition, which is what we've done here. Uh, but in general, you can learn large distribution if you have more data. All right. Okay, so one intuition of our setting, we call it operator learning, is that we want to learn the operator in a mesh environment setting. A traditional neural network, such as convolution neural network or UNITES, they discretize the input function into a, a specific grid. Uh, so I'm taking it as a ve like vector to vector mapping. But when we do specific discretization, we lost certain like uh, information of the input function, output functions. Uh, we want to kind of discretize it in a like continuous way, and in that sense, we can keep more information and make it a more efficient representation. For example, when we use the Fourier methods. Another intuition is uh, when we use like traditional convolutional neural network. The filtering in convolution neural networks are really local three by three filters. And uh, we found out that this super three local filter is very good for real life image. Uh, it's good to detect edge and shape as uh, translate invariants. Um, but for the PDE setting, the input and op are continuous functions. And in that sense, we, we feel it's more efficient to represent function in the Fourier filters where the filters are global and continuous. Uh, if uh, it's more, but the PD setting, the Fourier filter is more efficient compared to like local discrete convolutional filters. Okay, that's the motivation parts. Uh, we're going to move the concrete setting of neural operator. In general, uh, on a high level, the neural operator become post-linear transform and the non-linear transform, kind of like a neural network with some linear multiplication and some activation function, but in the operator sense. Uh, so by combining like linear operation and non-linear operation, in general, the whole operator can be highly non-linear. Okay, so take a little bit concrete settings. Uh, here, this is the second order elliptic equation again. Uh, we want to learn the map from function A to function U. Uh, we fix for source F here. And so we want to define this operator as the function, as the operator from this function space A to the function space U. Okay. The intuition here is that uh, we can learn, we can write this fun solution function as a Green's function representations. The solution U can be write as a convolution of a kernel or the green function G, X, Y, with the source function F. And in our sense, we fix the solution function F. Uh, we can also make it a little bit generalized as the U is the integration of the green function with F plus some, something, solution U here. Here, the input function A is coming into the green function. So the green function is going to depend on input function A. And the solution can be right as integration of some green function depend on A with the source function. This is 
what we call the green function representation or this like convolution or integration kind of. And our intention is just to replace this green function with a neural network. Uh, so instead of having this G here, we approximate it by a neural network called Kappa, parameterized by phi. It takes inputs x, y, and ax and ay because this kernel is going to depend on function a. And we uh, kind of set it as an iterative solver where the v0 is the initial conditions and we update it to like v1, v2 for each layers until the last time vt, which is final output solutions. Yes, so we basically we use the uh, green function formulations as a uh, intuition or motivations, and we formulate the iterative solver, which is we have t layers here, and given the first layer inputs v zero, we update each layer by uh, first doing integration with the learned kernel, add a bias term, and do the activation function. So this is one layer. We do this T layer to get the final solutions. But usually, if uh, a PD has a green function formulations, one layer will be sufficient. Uh, you can represent, you can learn the green function exactly and represent this just as the green functions. But usually, uh, for the harder, more complex nonlinear equations, it doesn't uh, admit. Uh, green function formulations. So you cannot just learn it's one iterate in one iterations. So the reason why we want to have T iteration like concatenate together to learn more complex representations. Uh, Intuition is that the map from A to U is hard. So we kind of truncate it into T sub step and each operator learn one sub step. Okay. So, so yeah. Uh, what is the uh, new of x? Uh, new, uh, new of x, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a measure here. So you usually we just use the uniform measure. So new of x dx is just dx. Gotcha. But we can, we can add this probability to, to that. Got it, thanks. Thanks. Okay. So in a more abstract sense, we can formulate this new orbital in this sense, where k is the integration or it's the green function formulations, which is a linear operator as non-local, kind of like the convolution or it's a linear the vector matrix multiplication where we're using the normal neural networks. And sigma is just the standard activation functions. It is local but non-linear. So the framework of you neural know, operator is just we alternate in composing uh, the linear non-local operators with uh, local non uh, local nonlinear activation functions, and by combining it, this operator can express very, very com complex and nonlinear uh, solution operator in PDs. And to enhance it, we also have a kind of encoder decoder settings, the P, Q in the end, uh, where we first leave the input into a higher dimension representations. So it's like for each point AX, it could be a scalar. We leave this scalar to a, for example, 32 dimension vectors. So the input is not, so here V0 is not an image. It, it has like a channel space of 32. And we do this for each channel. And in the end, we project back to a, image or to the to one dimension setting. So this uh, encoder and decoder setting leads to higher dimension, make it possible or to enhance the expressiveness of the framework and make it easier to learn like higher frequency domain, especially on the Fourier domain. But is that, so is this lifting uh, essentially, did you figure out that it was useful empirically or is there a theoretical justification why it's uh, useful? Yeah, so mostly empirical. Okay. Uh, we also have some intuition here. It's like 
if we only have one dimension, and when we do later to the fewer domains, when we crank out the higher frequency modes, we just lost them. Mm -hmm. But if we have higher, higher dimension representations, then when we crank out the higher frequency modes on each dimension, when we recover back, when we decode it, we can recover the higher dimension modes. Yeah, but we'll talk about detail later. Yeah, so the answer is uh, yes, so it's empirically verified. So one quick question. Uh, so when you're projecting from lower dimension to higher dimension, so are you sort of like uh, gaining information? Or so how, how does the uh, output of the encoder have some sort of more information than the input of the encoder? Because in typical uh, encoder decoder, usually the bottleneck is of lower dimension, right? Where you're compressing information. But oh, in this so case, it's the opposite. Yeah, we're now compressing. Uh, the information. So maybe it's not proper to call it encoder decoder. Okay. So we just leave it to higher dimension. So allowing this operator to, to be done on multiple dimensions. So okay. yeah. Okay, okay so uh, this is general framework of neural operators. Uh, the main work, uh, we have like four variations. So how to do this integration efficiently because if we're going to do this full uh, integration, the exact solutions, if I have n points in the domain, then uh, we will need n square computation. To, uh, we're going to do n of these integrations, and each one has n complexity, n, n square, which is really very expensive, especially if we have to evaluate this kernel network on n square, n square time, uh, which is just too expensive. So we developed like multiple approximation scheme uh, to efficiently do these in integrations. Uh, the periods two are based on graph methods. Basically, we do some disorganization and do the integration on graph. And then we have low rank and the later Fourier methods. Okay, so graph-based neural operator. So basically, we uh, do the discretization and do the integration on graph with some kind of sampling. Yeah, so on the top, this is the updates we had for the new arbitrary in the continuous sense. Uh, if we construct a graph on the physical domain, then this integration is, can be read as a discrete sum uh, where uh, we just sum each point uh, when we have these kernels. So this kernel can kind of be taken as a, uh, the kernel of the graph, graph kernels, which is also the adjacent matrix. In that sense, if we're going to do this n square uh, continuous integrations, my kernel is a full like n square kernel. If I have n nodes, then my kernel is like n by n matrix, right? So I just write in my integration in graph. And then later I can define my graph uh, with sampling and connection connectivity to make it more efficient. Right? So, so the procedure is like uh, we have training pairs and we construct random graph sampling. So usually we will sample a bunch of points on this domain and connect them with respect to a radius. And once the graph is connected, where we define the integrations, then we directly learn this kernel network by using graph neural network message passing. Okay. And when we learn the kernel, we can we learn the equations. For new query, we can just have the graph and run the neural graph neural networks with the learned equations, with the learned neural network kernel. So the point is we we'll only learn one universal kernel for all the equations. Uh, the kappa phi n is this universal of all equations. Uh, so once it is learned, we can evaluate any points because for that specific uh, location, we can add the nodes here and do the graph message passing to a point value of that nodes. So in this sense, 
because graph is a very general uh, like structure, we can evaluate any kind of mesh we have. So in that sense, it's continuous in the domain. But sorry, when you when you say no interpolation needed, uh, when you have a new node, don't you have to connect it to existing nodes in order to apply that kernel? Uh, that's right. So we connect to existing nodes, but it's not a kind of like explicit interpolations. So interpolation is done implicitly with the message passing graph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you establish the connections in the in the first place? So in this sense, we just connect each node with other nodes with respect to a certain radius. I see. Uh -huh. So that's kind of a respect to the neutron approximations. So basically, given the n square nodes, we will sample the graph by sample randomly sample nodes or adaptly sample nodes. That is given this n by n square kernel matrix, we're going to like sample row and columns to approximated by this sub matrix of the kernel matrix. And uh, we observe that we don't need too many nodes samples. So even though each equation is sampling, it's going to cause some errors. But when we do this from sampling for all, for example, 1,000 training case, the variance kind of average out. So the average can cancel out. So we observe like 200 nodes as quite efficient, like no matter what is the base resolution we have. So even we have like 1 million nodes, like 1,000 by 1,000 resolution grid, uh, sample 200 nodes quite efficient. So this can be done very fast, and also it doesn't compromise accuracy. And currently, we just use uniform sampling with kind of Monte Monte Carlo integration, which is less efficient. But the point to do this is from approximation is we can evaluate ways uh, when we sample the nodes. For the harder parts or the stiff parts, we can sample more nodes, and for the like, easier parts, we can sample less. And doing this adaptively, we can use less nodes to represent more complicated structure. Sorry, what do you mean by easier and more difficult? So for example, I have a, a special domain and some of the special domain has like difficult geometry or uh, the solution is very is singular as that domain. Mm -hmm. Then I can sample more nodes to capture singularity. But how do you, how do you detect that? Uh, how do you detect those scenarios? Yeah, so if it's given in geometry, it's easy. We can just like hand define that, but uh, we can also kind of heuristically capture that by look, taking a look at the gradient of the solution, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, but there's, I guess, it's, we don't have a very general rule to do that yet. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the base work, the graph neural orbiters. And then uh, we move to the multiple graph neural orbiter, which is the paper is going to appear in new RIPs. Uh, the basic intuition is here is uh, instead of just using one graph, we're, we are going to construct multi-level graph. Uh, because when you're using one graph, uh, we're basically just doing some initial approximation and given the radius r, the number of edges is still n square, right? Uh, if we're going to have a large R. So to do it more, even more efficiently, we can construct multi-level of graph. In this case, the top graph captures the fine or the very local edge, and middle range graph captures the like middle range kernel, and the bottom graph is just going to capture the long range, the coarse uh, interactions. So Basically, we just construct multi-level of graphs, and each graph is going to capture like a certain range of the kernel or a certain range of the interactions. And also, each graph is going to be linear in complexity. So, by adding them together, so we can capture a full range. We don't like truncate to a specific radius again, but we can capture full range of interaction, still maintaining a kind of linear complexity. Yeah, so this is actually corresponding to the hierarchical matrix decompositions. Recalling we have this like n by n kernel matrix. So 
to decompose it into multiple level of graphs is to kind of decompose the kernel matrix into the uh, local parts, the mid-range parts, and forest parts. The local part is a sparse kind of diagonal like uh, matrix. The long range part is full, but it's coarse in a sense it's low rank. And we can just write this kernel matrix K as the sum of this kernel. And then we uh, use what's so called the VSEC algorithm within the multi grid and multiple settings. So basically, run this. Uh, message passing or run this integration in a certain order, you can write this kernel K uh, as some multi resolution decompositions. So basically, we just do this as K11, and in this channel, it's a like low rank composition of the second one, and in the last channel, it's the even higher low rank decomposition of the third kernels, which is kind of corresponding to the uh, multiple masses raising the traditional masses. Can you, can you talk a bit about the, the motivation for, for this uh, multi-resolution uh, method? So uh, yeah. does it, is it useful because uh, you basically solve the problem at the, at, at the sparse level first uh, and then you can refine if you want or does it help you guide the solution better, or what? Why? Why did you have to resort to a multi-resolution uh, system? Yeah, yeah. So small motivation is want to even like reduce the complexity of the graph networks. Mm -hmm. so recalling the period settings, we truncate to the specific resolution R, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the my kernel is one specific kernel, and it's truncate all all the like longer interactions, right? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, we, we lose certain like, information of the kernel, we, we lose the longer interactions. Mm -hmm. To efficiently do that kernel, I need to sample more points, right? Yeah. So in this setting, I have like different graph capture different range, so I, I can no longer lose this long range interactions. And in a sense, I, I don't need that many points. I can save some composition for by using this like multi branch structure for the graph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so this is the multi graph or the multiple uh, settings. Uh, we're going to move to Fourier neural orbiter. So so in the Fourier neural orbiter, basically we just restrict integration to a convolution and do this convolution with Fourier transform. Yeah, again, so uh, intuition is that uh, we're thinking maybe the Fourier representation is more efficient compared to the convolution neural network or compared to this local kind of discrete uh, integrations because uh, Fourier filter is continuous and global and very thinking it can be more efficient to represent the input output continuous functions. Yeah, so basically we just restrict these integrations to a convolution. And by the convolution theorem, we can do this convolution on a spatial domain as a pointwise linear transformation on the Fourier domain, right? So given this input V, we just first do a Fourier transform and some linear transformation R here, and then the inverse for a transform. So basically we just uh, represent this convolution on the spatial domain as a multiplication on the Fourier domain. All right, so this is what's showing the figure. We first do the Fourier transform and do some linear multiplications and the inverse Fourier transform. And usually we don't need all the all the frequency modes. Uh, we find out it's efficient to truncate the Fourier modes and just do the leave out the lower modes here. And it kind of helps about the aliasing problem and saves the complexity. Yeah. So this is a piece of code. It's, it's super simple. We just first do the Fourier transform, 
some linear multiplications and the inverse Fourier transform. And we find out that uh, even when we truncate out the higher frequency modes, uh, empirically, it can still predict uh, higher, higher frequency solution functions, uh, solution function with slow decay. Uh, because we have this activation function and decoder networks, we, we kind of recover the higher frequency mode we truncate out in the Fourier domains. It's like if I, I only have one like, dimension, when I truncate out, it, it loses. But if we have like 32 dimension channel space, and some of this channel space is going to recover the higher frequency modes. Another problem of the Fourier methods, uh, the tra traditional Fourier methods, is that you can only appear apply on the periodic boundaries because Fourier basis is periodic. Uh, but for our Fourier layer, it can it doesn't restrict it to the uh, periodic boundaries. So because the, we keep track of the non-periodic parts with our bias term, so basically we decompose this uh, map, decompose the, the operators to the periodic parts, which is captured by the uh, Fourier transform, and the non-periodic parts, which is left out on the bias term. So in the end, uh, we can still learn non-periodic boundary solutions. And the complete complexity of the Fourier layer uh, for transform in general take n square. If I only care about the lowest, like for example, k frequency modes, then it's n times k. It's kind of linear. Uh, if we just do the fast Fourier transform, then it's n log n. Right? The linear part is easy, it's log is O n. So it's much faster than the original kind of n square graph based methods. And it's still resolution invariant and mesh invariance because my basis, for example, when I truncate to like 20 Fourier modes, this 20 Fourier modes can be evaluated on any resolutions. So it doesn't like restrict to a specific resolution. Uh, it can learn on one resolution and uh, test on another resolution. And the training resolution can be different as well. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the experiments. So this is just a uh, two examples, one D boson equations, uh, which admit uh, ex explicit green function formulations. On the left hand side, it is the uh, explicit green function, we call it Guang Chu's. On the right hand side, where we approximate the green, the green function with neural networks, here we only have one layer without activation functions. And it can be seen that our framework does learn the target green functions. It can make sense in our intuitions. Uh, so the second example is the 2D Darcy flow problem. The input is the coefficient A, again, the output is the solution U. And here A is sampled from a random Gaussian fields and it's truncated into a like, binary the two piece constants. And in this problem, we can, um, like for example, train on a very fine resolution, 16 by 16 grid, and test on a high resolution data. Uh, so in that sense, it still has a very small error when we do this zero shot super resolution task. The third example is the uh, Wendy Berger's equations. Uh, here, the viscosity V we're taking this range from 1 over 10 to 1 over 1,000. So the input kind of looks like this. It's sampled from, again, random Gaussian fields. They have more bumps. And so this is a two case. The red is one case, blue is another case. And we're mapping to the, uh, like, this is, this is time zero solutions. We're mapping to time one solutions. So time, in time one, it's kind of average out for each two case. So this is in the Berg equation, we map from the time zero solution to time one solutions. So th there's some benchmarks. Uh, so basically the Fourier neural operator 
is, has very surprisingly good accuracy. It outperforms all our previous work and also other deep learning based methods. And most importantly, it is resolution invariance. In that sense, the quality depends only on data, it doesn't depend on the resolutions. Sorry, what are, what are these other baselines? Uh, so uh, the baseline we compare is, for example, FCN's fully convolutional neural network, uh, where we tune the network on a smaller resolution and evaluate it on okay. other resolutions. Uh, so it kind of makes sense here. It's the resolution of convolutional neural network grows because one specific, specific architectures only work on one specific resolution. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the purple ones, the graph neural operators, the blue one is the multiple graph neural operators, and the red one is just the nearest neighbor graph convolution neural network. Why do you, why do you think that it did uh, so badly compared to the others? Because uh, this graph neural network, it only captures the local information where we use the near neighbor structure. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, so it loses too many mid range, long range interactions. Okay, so this one is the Navistro equation. Uh, it's really hard to solve in the traditional methods. So here we've, we have a force time f, which is forced to be this, is changing in time. And uh, the, we're mapping from the time zero verticity to layer time verticity. The verticity is sampled from, again, a random Gaussian field. And we try three different the scarcity, uh, one over one thousand to like one over hundred thousand. So this is a virtualization of the data set. Each col each column is one case. So this is one over one thousand. It's it's kind of luminar in the one over one thousand. It's kind of periodic. So this one is kind of mild and nice. And this is for one over 10,000. Uh, in this case, it's start to become chaotic in the end. And for one over 100,000, it's even more chaotic at the early time step. And here, so for one over 1,000, it's kind of luminar flow. As for one well, over 10,000, 100,000 is moving to the turbulent regime. Okay, so this is uh, a loss for the stokes equations, where it's the uh, FNO 3D, the FUNO 3D is the Fourier method when we do the 3D Fourier convolutions. And all other, including Fourier 2D methods, we do RNN type structure. So we but all the regressive structures. So it can be seen that the Fourier method has the best performance among all the settings. So this, this is a virtualization of one over 10,000 viscosity, and this is a zero shot super resolution where we train on 64 by 64 by 20 and uh, evaluate on 12. 256 by 256 by 80s. Yeah, so the mid range is the ground truth. The red column is the uh, prediction. It's, it's very close. In the end, we do a Bayesian inverse problem we were given the final time solution and we want to recover the initial condition. Uh, this is, uh, here we do a MCMC methods. Basically we use the solver and also our learned neural network to make this prediction, uh, to make prediction of the sampling of the MCMC methods. And it can be seen that the inference in neural networks is super fast. So even we use very coarse setting of the solvers it's like a uh, three magnitude fast compared to the solvers when it's learned. So wait, this is this is really cool. So mm -hmm. don't you need like symplectic operators to preserve the energy while going back uh, to do this? Oh, so we're not learning the inverse operators, but mm -hmm. uh, 
we have this four orbiters from time zero to later time step, and we recover the map from the Bayesian analysis. So basically, we have a posterior on the initial conditions, and yeah, each time yeah. We, we yeah. But I think I think you can go backwards without doing MCMC is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So I guess inverse problem there motivate to do that. We can experience a method or gradient based methods where we can directly learn a solver. Yeah. In, ge in general, the inverse problem is kind of ill posed because for, for one later time step, there are multiple potential solutions on the initial condition. Yeah. Right? Because as you can see, the initial condition is, is kind of, it's some of the front cause and field, so it's noisy. Yeah. And yeah. So, so this is a one Samples, but uh, one example we do to compare with space solver, where you use base mass. But yes, you can you can do other methods. Good, good. Okay, uh, so future works. Uh, in our settings, we use uh, neural operators to learn the solution of time t to a later time step t plus delta. And um, for like the simpler e example, so one over one thousand number silk, we can directly learn from like time zero to time 50, that's fine. But for hard equations, uh, we have to like shorter the time step because it just become too hard. Uh, so we're thinking about to like even reduce the time step for even harder equations. And in that sense, it can be combined with a solver. Uh, for example, we, have a, we can have a coarse grid solvers and augment the coarse grid with the uh, neural operators. So in that sense, I don't need to have a one over 10,000 delta t in my solvers to have a like, reasonable solution. Maybe I can have a delta t to be one or point one. In that sense, we can like dramatically speed up training the solver. Uh, we can also combine with uh, like physics informed type neural now type of neural networks. So basically, we can use uh, our filter to predict a coarse grid on the uh, domain and use this as a constant when I apply physically informed neural physically informed neural networks. And it may help the physically informed network to parameterize the solution. Okay, uh, so take away, uh, we use data-driven methods to learn the equation instead of solve the equations. Uh, it's slow to learn, but it's fast to, to the inference. Uh, operator learning is that uh, we want to parameterize the solution in a machine environment ways. Uh, in that sense, it can be evaluated at, at every layer, and the error should be consistent with the resolutions. Uh, for our newly developed the Fourier methods, uh, the intuition is that as expression to represent the solution, especially continuous input and outputs on the Fourier domain. And currently, we can evaluate this methods on never stock equation up to 10,000 uh, renal numbers. And it is accurate on the, accurate than the deep learning masses, faster than the conventional masses. In future work, we want to compare with sol solver and skill ups, that kind of thing. Okay, thanks. Uh, is there any questions? Thank you, this was wonderful, I think, Zongi. Any questions before? You can ask uh, uh, no, before I can I get to ask. I was just curious about like big picture limitations uh, according to you uh, of Fourier neural operators. Uh, so the question is, what's the big uh, picture of the big picture limitations of this approach? Yeah, the big picture is that uh, we develop a Fourier layer for a new network as a substitute of convolution neural network. It do global uh, global convolution instead of local convolutions, and we found out it's uh, more efficient to do the like PDE settings, especially the input and output continuous functions. But I guess for your world image, uh, convolution network is still better. Uh, I guess another limitation is the uh, non-periodic boundaries. Still, fewer layer only address periodic boundaries. Even when we capture it with a bias term, it's not our main strength. Yeah. Thanks.
Mosin, if you want, you can um, uh, unmute. Just had so a motion has a yeah, go ahead. for the input matter in this case, because intuitively the greens function changes a lot depending on the coordinates and it could be easier or hard to approximate. Uh, so could you repeat your question? Oh, sorry. So does the choice of the coordinates to represent the input and output have any effect for the learning? Because intuitively the coordinates change the form of the greens function and it would affect how easy or difficult it is to approximate. Yes, that's right. So uh, the mesh or the implicit mesh of the data does influence the uh, uh, influence the uh, like performance agreement functions. In general, when we do the random samplings, uh, it can, this kind of structure kind of allows. So when we learn the graph neural networks from a random sampling, it's, it doesn't subsist to a specific mesh. But I think, yes, you can adaptly define this mesh or define the graph such that it can be learned more efficiently. Yeah, I guess it, if it answered your question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I have one super basic question. Um, I, I'm still a little confused about exactly what information about the function and the initial conditions one needs before they can use your method. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a dynamics model and you have the equations for the dynamics model. Is, is it just a matter of plugging in the, like do you plug in the equations anywhere or is it the, just that, like if I have that plus the initial conditions and then I can just use your method to see how the model evolves over time or, yeah. okay. So it's a black box method. You don't need to have the specific equations if I it see. speaks. Yeah. So if you have time zero dynamic, you can predict later time dynamic. I see. What, but okay. So so then, but then, how does it differentiate between different dynamics if I'm just giving the initial condition um, at the start? Yeah. So uh, if the dynamic is gonna change, then it shall come into the inputs. If, for example, if if it can. If that contains some differential operator, that should come into the inputs. Okay, okay, I yeah. see, I see, I see. All right, thank you. Yeah. So in your case, the you need examples of, uh, you need training, uh, training examples from the actual uh, solver right. to, um, uh, to learn this, right? So I was right. wondering, how do you know if you've covered enough uh, sufficiently many examples or do you, how do you know when you need more training data uh, because uh, to better train your uh, your operator uh, so like, empirically if the training error is low testing error is high that means we need more training data mm -hmm. but in general it depends on the settings uh, if a lot of things are changing then probably we need more data if we have hard equations chaotic equations then we need more data Mm -hmm. uh, if the time period is longer, we need more data. Yeah. So how does this compare uh, with, let's say, other kinds of solvers? So you de define pins was one example as an extension. Then there is something called SimNet, which is also yeah. uh, simulating these kind of VDEs under different different boundary conditions. And they are different from data-driven methods in the same way you were mentioning that. You don't need to retrain if, let's say, mesh resolution changes or boundary conditions change or something like that. Uh, so for example, we mentioned the same nights, which is kind of basic similar to the phase inform neural network, uh, where we have a neural network to model the solution functions. But in our case, we use the neural network to model the operator. The difference is that when you use a neural network to model solution functions, you have to retrain the model for each instance. Right? So given new equations, you have to do auto regression to get the new solutions. But in our case, once the neural network is trained, uh, in the inference time, we only do the inference. Given new equation, we can just do evaluation based inference. We don't need to update the neural network. In essence, it's faster compared to physically informed or same type, type of architecture. And while this may come across as very sort of, um, let's say, practitioner's view of question, 
do you anticipate there being any challenges, either technical or computational, in scaling? So right now, the examples and the data sets that you have shown clearly are very interesting and impressive, and the performance clearly is very good. But what happens if I want to solve uh, these sort of differential equations of slightly larger scale, uh, when the scale is beyond just, let's say, 2D images, uh, or the mesh is very big, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I see. So if we want to scale up to like larger resolutions, uh, we're probably going to do some parallelization on GPUs, because one GPU has only, for example, 16 gigabits. Currently, we just do everything on single GPUs. That's single GPU. Yeah. But when we want to scale it up, uh, we're going to parallel these models, I guess. So, so each part is, I guess, parallelable. So the linear multiplication is easy. Uh, if we're going to do graph neural network, uh, the convolution can be done on each symbol. It can be no. distributed. Yeah. yeah. For the Fourier method, uh, the main difficulty to do parallel is the Fourier transform, I guess. Uh, but I guess still there are many ways to do that parallelly. People have studied that. So I think it's possible or it's not that hard to do parallel parallelization, model parallelization for the Fourier masses. In, in your case, empirically, uh, when you said you used the GPU with 16 gigs of memory, did you observe that uh, you were operating with full GPU utilization in terms of memory or compute? Uh, your question is the uh, utilization of GPUs? Yes, in the sense that uh, practically when you, were, when you were looking at these experiments uh, mm -hmm. with Fourier neural operators, were you operating at the limit of performance of the GPU in the sense of uh, compute or memory? Uh, so it depends so, on, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So the, I guess one of the constraints is uh, memory. If you're going to have a larger resolutions, you have to put it in the memory and restrict to restrict the performance and restrict the number of parameters you can have. But eternity seems not to be a problem, so you it, it, it just take the eternity and run. Yeah. Okay. So one of the one of the advantages of neural networks could be that they could be used to map your original equation into a space that the equation is easier to easier to solve. Uh, right. And um, and maybe then you can map back to the original space. Uh, I'm wondering if you've thought about uh, directions like that, uh, or whether they are feasible, and uh, you know whether people have been uh, trying to work that out in the in the past. Uh, so like use an encoder decoder to put in a, like easier space and learn it on the on that space. Yeah, more like a one to one, more like a diffeomorphism where you uh, transform the original equation into a new space, but you have some way to guarantee that in the new space the thing is going to be easier to solve than in the old space. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, but uh, I'm not very sure how to do this diffeomorphism. So I guess one way we did here, the so lifting and projection is like one way to make the equation easier to solve. We will lift this one dimension thing to higher dimensions, things become more linear here and easier to yeah. But uh, if you're going to use new network and, well, I guess we, we do use new network to parameterize this P and Q lift and projection. Uh, but we just leave the dimension. Like, I guess you can do like more interesting thing to do some diffeomorphism. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Yeah. I think if there are no more questions, Let's uh, thank Zongi once again for the wonderful talk and uh, for, for such sort of detailed answers to multiple of our questions. Uh, I guess some of us are meeting you uh, after the talk on uh, a yeah. one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, so to all the students, uh, I think there might still be slots or you can couple up and, and meet Zongi 
in the following slots. Thank you, Zongi, once again. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.